Good evening and welcome to the thir Thursday, August 10th, 2017 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. We'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Present. 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 Thank you very much. So the first item on our agenda is the public comment period. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak during the public comment period? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I'll move forward to announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Yes, Ms. Um Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so the first thing was I, I was appointed to the um, Massachusetts Association of School Committee Members, their resolutions committee, and met last month with them um, and got to sit down with members, about 10 members from across the state to um, review all of the resolutions that have been submit from other districts across the state and discuss them and vote on which ones would move forward to be voted on by the delegate assembly at the conference in November. Um, and so it was really interesting and um, we just, had a lot of discussion, voted, put our recommendations forward, and right now they are with the executive board who will make the final decision, run it through legal, and then we will know in October what is actually gonna come before the delegate assembly for our voting delegate to vote on. So if at any point before then, once the, those proposals are out, anyone wants to have a group discussion about any of them, um, I have a little bit more background information now that I was part of the process. So. That was the first thing. And the second is, is I'd like to ask you all to save the date, um, October 14th between 3 and 5 p.m. Um, school locals organizing another um, celebration of the Northampton Public Schools. And obviously, we'd love it if you could all be a part of that. Um, there's more information to follow, but for now, I was just hoping everybody would save the date. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? Okay, um, hearing none, uh, we'll now move in to the uh, reports and recommendations. Um, and we have no consent agenda this evening. We just have a series of uh, votes for approval. And the first item is our uh, student handbooks for the 2017 and 2018 school year. And I believe we have some of our administrators here to present those. So whoever's presenting, if you'd like to come up, uh, are we, Sarah, you're going to go first? Okay. I think you've been nominated, uh, <laughs> Principal Madden. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I hope you looked at our lengthy handbook. I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of the, the major changes. Uh, we did update our school choice and open enrollment section to reflect what's actually happening, which is always a good thing. Um, we updated our delay and cancellation information, which was out of date. And we also removed the work sampling information for kindergarten, uh, as the kindergarten teachers no longer give assessment information through the work sampling program. Uh, so those, I think, are the, the major changes. As principals, we're really glad that we are a coherent foursome with a unified mindset, and we're certainly working to bring consistency to our elementary schools. And the handbook is one, one way that we have been doing that. And I can assure you that we'll continue to work on the updates. I also wanted to just mention that our code of conduct is very different from the middle school and the high school. As principals, we really hope to educate all of our students about safety and respect and self-control. We feel like the most important aspects of the code of conduct are right at the beginning, the main goals, to really work on making sure that we have a respectful environment where everyone is treated with respect and dignity and to have a safe and orderly environment where all students can learn and to teach and model behaviors of responsible citizenship. Um, I think all four of us see discipline as something that needs to be taught, and we work hard to teach, talk, listen, and communicate with families before consequences are given. However, when safety is jeopardized, we do give consequences as we see fit, and the loss of recess is never given for any academic difficulties, but on very rare occasions for dangerous actions, a loss of a recess could be used as a deterrent for unsafe behavior. In these rare circumstances, Movement is always offered. We believe that every child needs physical movement throughout the day. So luckily at Ryan Road, we have a little entryway that <laughs> is very good for jump roping if anybody misses yourself. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, Ms. Fallon. Um, so I was just going to ask that you um, remove the sentence that says that the school committee approves bus stop locations from page 15 of the handbook, since that's not something that we are doing. It's not the mayor either. Just the <laughs> Everybody get it off your ears. <laughs> Uh, and then I know you said you updated the school choice section. Um, can we add a statement that siblings will be given preference? Because that wasn't included. And I don't. I don't know if we need to cite the law for that or not. I'm assuming we don't. Okay. And, and students will be given preference, but is it a guarantee? I mean, preference does not. Uh, Dr. <coughs> okay, well, since the question is on the table, I, I do want to just answer how that works. What sibling preference means is that when we have open seats in a grade level, um, siblings of currently enrolled students would be the first one selected. If we have more siblings and we have spaces, then there would be a lottery for those siblings. Um, and then the lottery system would take effect for the rest of the non-sibling students that we're doing school choice openings for. But if there are no seats open in the grade level, or if there are fewer seats open than there are siblings, then it's not a guarantee. So that's what preference means. But that's all spelled out in another a policy that's or is it is the handbook the only place that that's we have a I believe we have a school choice policy um, there is a statute around school choice that explains how the process works and then my only other thing was that um, so and it would apply to all three handbooks is that we are going to be voting on um, policy JLCD on the administering medicine medicines to students tonight um, and I guess I would just ask that if you guys review any of the changes so that the, the student handbook updates whatever the most recent policy is. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your careful review. Um, thank you. Um, is this, this, so this is for all four schools, right? Yes, it is. So on, um, just a couple of quick things. Like on page 26, we talk about early childhood and we talk about offering half-day programs. I think that policy was changed last year where we now offer full-day programs at Leeds and Bridge. So, so we so offer both. There's a half-day and a full-day program. Yeah, so this, this explicitly says we offer half-day without any mention of full-day. So we might want to clarify okay. that unless that policy changed. Um, and Barbara Black is retiring, and I, the contact information should be updated for that. I, you know, I, I noticed that that too, and she's not retiring till the end of September. So I did think, well, we'll update it for the next time. I felt like we shouldn't mm -hmm. eliminate her until she's <laughs> retired. <laughs> yes, um, because I personally am married to the person who's now the early childhood person. Um, I think she's handling the phone calls now for the mm -hmm. for the family engagement piece under that. So I think Barbara would agree that that's okay. But I'll leave it to your description. Um, on page 29, you talked about work sampling. I'm more, I'm too, it's a two-part. One is, again, I'm pretty sure that the preschool teachers are still using work sampling. Preschool, yes, not kindergarten. But preschool, I think, sometimes does use the work sampling. They do. So why are we eliminating that, unless I'm looking at an older version? But it seems like it's eliminating that, which is an important piece of, of information that we share back and forth with parents. So why, why would we eliminate the? Why not just take out? It's about reporting and assessment, and I, um, you know, I, I think that when you're reporting out, it, it's certain. Uh, it's a changes when you become in kindergarten, and you would get report cards at certain times of year. And I think that with the preschool, I, my understanding, although I don't have preschool in my building, is that you always meet with the parents and talk about um, all sorts of different assessments. I, I think it's a little bit different when you handing a report cards to parents. I don't know, but I can certainly talk to. Okay. people in preschool and see if they want to change that was it their idea to change it it's called report cards and progress reports and so work sampling is a progress report so I, again I, I if that's something the district does and I believe it's a great system to kind of engage parents and keep their kids informed of what's happening it seemed like that would be just it's just a mistake to mm -hmm. pull out preschool 
unless that whole report is changing that section. But I would, I'm also wondering what's happening then with kindergartners. Do we are they doing a, a different type of are they doing report cards? Are they doing yes? Yeah, so the report cards it, it lists their rep, uh, they meet with parents in October, yeah. and then report cards go home in February and at the end of the year. So they're gonna they're gonna use the same report cards that we use for one through five. Well, it's, it's the same type of report card. It's not the same report card. It's a kindergarten report card. Gotcha. Yeah, right. So the standards would be different. Right. All right. So you'll be able to check whether work sampling should be entered back in. Yes. To what we, how we work with parents of kids in preschool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. All set, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Sansky. Uh, well, my colleagues covered most of it, but uh, just one question. So I notice in blue is No Child Left Behind Act on page, maybe on page um, 31. Maybe that's because it's going to be changed or removed since it's yes. no longer in effect. Okay, got it. That's it. Um, I just want to say I think that it's, you know, it's so great to have updated handbooks. <laughs> And one of the things is what a living document it is that, you know, things are changing and that there's preschools at two of our schools, but not at four of them, which makes a singular document right. harder, but maybe, you but know. If you're listing it as preschool in the. That's oh, right. I think right. that's fine. Then everybody can. That's what I was going to say and to, you know, it's something that we're really proud of and, and are definitely a part of the schools. So I would hope that, you know, we find a way to. Um, support what Lonnie is talking about. I think it's really great. Okay. Any other questions for Principal Madden? Okay. So um, I believe we also now have a presentation from Ms. Mount. Okay, so I'm here to um, review the changes in the JFK student handbook. And we have update, well, we actually have a new uh, cover page that we're going to be putting on that, and that um, was developed by a student. It actually came from um, students who were asked to present uh, front covers for the um, course catalog. And this one struck, the, the group that was working with that struck the adults in such a way, so they asked the student to tweak this a little and um, then decided to have it be our new code of conduct, I mean handbook cover. So that's where that came from. Um, we did update, <coughs> excuse me, the director of student services name on page seven. We adjusted the grade levels for the guidance counselors as they loop with the students. So we changed those names to uh, match the grades that they'd be working with. Um, we updated the transportation uh, phone number. We added the scent reduced environment as well. Um, we updated the dates on the code of conduct summary to be current for this coming school year. And we removed the gum is not allowed during school or related school, uh, school related events. So students are now allowed to chew gum. Um, and my guess is there'll be some questions about that. I'm happy to answer them. And um, then we did add the fact sheet about information on the rights of all children to enroll in school. So those are really the changes that we have. And I can go ahead and talk about the gum piece or we'll wait for questions about it. Any questions? Uh, you, you're going to talk about what? The gum. 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 Um, can you, as part of that, I, I wasn't familiar with how the code of conduct being updated. Can you just give a little bit of background in terms of how that, what the genesis of that was and whether you work with other school on that specifically? Uh, we just updated the dates. So we put 2017 to 2018 dates under the code of conduct page on 20. Is that what your question is? Well, um, the only change in the code of conduct is the gum. Okay. So. When I look at the high school one, I know we're not there yet, but there was a pretty significant change in the high school that looks very similar to JFK in terms of the approach and um, different options that the principal has in order to um, consequence kids, if you will. Sure. So was that something that was not new for you, but it was new for the high school? I guess, or that was it there a are, effort? Yeah, so, so always it's at administrator's discretion based on the situation, the student experience. Um, but it is in our code of, uh, in our handbook yeah. around the various options. So it's always been in there. That, that part's not new, correct. Okay. okay. Any other questions about uh, 
Ms. Pusansky. Um, I was just curious. I always, I, we've referenced the whole kind of conflict resolution program at JFK numerous times in meetings and praise them, but yet I don't see it, I, am I missing it? I didn't see it anywhere in the handbook. And I'm always, especially when we talk about consequences, I'm kind of curious. There, uh, it is, um, I didn't. It is there that. and I it's didn't. Page well, it's 26. It's okay. written as restorative, I just think yeah, restorative to practices. Okay. You want to double, do you want to double check that? Let me look here as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, twenty-seven. Reference it. it. Just seems like we always kind of talk about the success of that program. It'd be nice to make sure that parents know about it. Absolutely. I'm seeing it, I'm, I see code of conduct. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I didn't understand, Rebecca. So you're saying that restorative justice isn't? Yeah. So a restorative justice conflict resolution. I can't remember exactly what it, we restorative call. practices, which is a form of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. um, so that's on 27, and it, it, there is we, we certainly um, I can talk about that in just a second, but ex expand on how that's written into the. Uh, oh, I see it. There. Handbook. Got it. But it does a little, um, you know, seven or eight sentences about the restorative restorative practices in the disciplinary process in regard to discretion and. Um, repair, we use the word repair here a lot, mm -hmm. uh, with students and with staff um, to try to to kind of step away from the punitive component of what you know, sometimes has to happen with disciplinary measures. Right. Yeah. No, oh, thank you for bringing that up. That's a. It just seemed like maybe under consequences or the code of conduct summary, it might be good to sort of weave it in there so uh, parents know that that's also a possibility. And then. My other question was, and this goes to the NHS handbook too, so I guess maybe we'll get to later, but under sexual harassment, if it would be useful to have a person's name that you could actually file a sexual harassment complaint with or an email, to me having to, you know, call a, I can't remember, sorry, I'm trying to get to the page while I'm talking yeah, about it at the same time, because it's page 54. Anyway, I, it's something I've sort of heard about and all the work that's being, um, done by the students to raise awareness around sexual harassment. And I also was just kind of curious in general, we had sort of, you mentioned in your report last month, and I know we've all talked about and read about and, and attended, et cetera, about sexual harassment, if we're not changing anything in the JFK or the NHS handbook in any way around the issue of sexual harassment, if anything's come out of that work. Um, Dr. Provost? I, I will be addressing it in my report later on tonight. Okay. I, we're, we're not making a recommendation to change the policy regarding sexual harassment, which is why I think that there's no change in the handbook recommended around sexual harassment. What we are recommending changes around are the implementation practices around the policy, some changes to curriculum, and then some changes to additional programming for kids. But the policy itself, I think, is, is a strong policy. One of the changes we'll be making around implementation is clarifying reporting practices for students. Okay, and is there a conf I mean, I just thought it might be good to have it be clear that there's a confidential way to report um, an issue around sexual harassment, and maybe even knowing a person's name might make it a little more friendly or more familiar than just a job title, and no email even in today's age. I don't know, just what are our what are our practices? It has the way we're allowing kids to report. Yeah, I mean that the conversation has been about who they would contact, and the, the the challenge for a student is if that's if that name that we give them or that email is not available, they're out. We, we don't want them to have an understanding that that's the person that they would respond to and not have other outlets. So I hear what you're saying, and we can and I'd like to think about that on how we can yeah. do that. As a as a protocol and steps for students, as that, as opposed to go oh, see Miss Mount if you have this, because if I'm unavailable, kiddos can kind of get stuck there. Well, Miss Mount was a, wasn't available, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, that's what I'm thinking anyway. I wouldn't want them to feel that I'm the only one, and I would be concerned that 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 they would hear that that I'm the person. For so example. Are you the sexual harassment coordinator? No, I just use myself as an, so as an example. So for example, whose phone number do we think is on, in the handbook? Yeah, you said 54. I must uh, maybe 59. my 59. I was wrong. Oh, okay. 59. What? That'd be you. There you go. Yeah, and it's. Oh, I see. The, who this phone number is is what you're saying. Okay. 
But I'm just asking, like, what, what's the, we're here, we're putting out the handbook, so what, what are the avenues that kids can use? And so maybe it would be worthwhile to add a sentence saying you could also go see your report a complaint to your guidance counselor, to principals, to any staff or administrator. Your um, complaint will be kept confidential. Here's an email. I don't know if that's in the policy itself that covers that piece or, or not. But this isn't this the handbook for parents and students? It mm -hmm. seems like that would be a useful right, so piece of it to explain I, to parents and students how I, the process works. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. I think it's important, I think, to keep in mind sort of the chronology and also keep in mind what the purpose of the review of the handbook is. So I'm not sure when the last time was that your school council met to review and update its handbook, but we're working on adjusting the, the reporting procedures for students right now. We haven't finalized what they are, so I'm certain that the school council wasn't, didn't have the opportunity to say, oh, here's the procedure, let's put it in the handbook. Um, also, the purpose of the review is to see if anything in the handbook con conflicts with the school committee policies or its, um, or the laws. So um, while what you're saying I think is very valuable and I think probably will be included in future editions, some of that is a work in progress. I think the question around sexual harassment is, do you see anything in there that conflicts with the school committee's policy around sexual harassment? And our school council did review this and did, I don't know, I wasn't at that meeting, whether it was a vote or some acceptance of this. So the school council did actually review this, if that's helpful for you to have that information. Ms. Fallon. I swear mine really is policy. Um, the buildings and grounds security <coughs> policy, surveillance equipment, it's on page 21 of your handbook and 42 of the high school handbook. We revised that policy in October of 2016. Um, so I would just ask that we put the new, po the updated policy in because it looks like this is the um, old policy in its entirety. Um, and it has been revised in the online policy manual. Okay. So I would just ask that we put the newer policy in. The buildings, the whole buildings and grounds. Yeah, that section. whole building and grounds. It's policy um, ECA. Policy ECA on building um, and ground security. Sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hold on. So, my <laughs> question: Can I ask you a question? <laughs> so, who sets who sets the district policy for consequences, student consequ consequences for behaviors or breaking code of conduct? Is that a central office, school there by are, school, school council? There are some practices that are outlawed by district policy, such as corporal punishment. Uh -huh. um, but then, if it's not that type of a sanction. The school councils have um, authority to to set the dis different um, consequences for infractions within their buildings. There are also some other um, constraints. There's Chapter 222, which prevents students from being um, long-term suspended from school. So yeah. that would be something um, that school councils can't do. But if they don't cross one of those red lines that's either set by law or set by school committee policy, then they have the ability within their school to set yeah. the consequences that they think are appropriate. Yeah. So yeah, an answer to part of that too is there's, sure. there's a couple of state laws that are very clear that they say that basically that it has to be at the discretion of the, of the administration. So there's, you know, actually, so there's a, that's why if you notice all these charts that give a sort of if this then this yeah, yeah, yeah. all have all have some words in it like some sort of fudging kinds of words because actually it can't be that it can't be that the administrator just says well we caught you doing this so we have to do this they actually administrators are actually required to exercise discretion by, by the state except we have <laughs> I know. I, except it doesn't show discretion. These show really well. They know, but if you, sort the, of the preambles. if you read their preambles and yeah. all these, they do that. Right. So I think that's and maybe I can pose the question. That's why I mean I'm really impressed with the code of conduct and how it's written. It seems very eclectic, good, you know, best intent for where, what the kids happening, taking a, a number of variables into account. But I'm just curious, as in your work on this and your work with the school council, and I believe the high school made this change. So maybe I'm. Maybe I'm confused, we'll get to that, but why, why remain so stringent on the consequences, particularly since 
the bulk of them are suspending kids regardless of what they did. Do you know what I mean? Like it, so why didn't we make changes to those discretionary well, charts? Not discretionary. They're the, you know, like oh. act, the the examples that yeah. that I find uncomfortable is like kids who w skip class. Their consequence is that they are suspended. Well, it's a potential. What's that? Potential. potential. It's always so it's potential. potential. Word. Potential. That's where the discretion comes in. And but it isn't an automatic. So I'm glad you're actually saying that. Because I am. Okay. So, <coughs> the, okay, I got you. So how does that work in the real world? What does potential mean? Are you doing potential because you, you need that at, you need to do that, but how does it really work? Are, are you, I don't know who, who is in charge of that and who makes the decisions, but. So a it, couple of questions were in there. So first, I didn't create this. Yeah, I know. Um, so that just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, and so the discretion, and it is written in a couple of other places, yeah. is an, on the administrator and as associate principal. I'm one of those that carries out that. So, for example, willful, obscene, appropriate, abusive, or profane language, et cetera, on top of page 29. The first time that happens, it's a potential of a day suspension. We really look at what was said, in what context it was said. Was it said publicly in the foyer, you know, when, or in the middle of a, an assembly? Or was it in a one-to-one -one situation with a teacher? All of those things come into play, and it's pretty, it's, it's a hard question to answer, yeah. except that it's very complicated um, to make those decisions. And all of the associate principals and the principals work daily on, on determining that. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't, because these are children, from my perspective, it isn't as simple as a formula. Um, and that's why the potential is there and the discretion piece is there. And I always come from the place of a restorative approach. Yeah. That's just my background and yeah. that's what moves me to work with, with students. So um, I'm, I probably with pretty, with surety here can say I've not suspended a student for a day, whether internal or external, for that offense, that first offense. In my experience with the students in this particular building, mm -hmm. so I don't know if that helped. That's but helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I ask? Sure. I'm so sorry. Um, how do you decide when to write restitution and and not? Is is restitution the returning of something, or is that restorative practice? So. Um, Obtaining money, material goods, or favors by threat or physical harm first is restitution. But other, you know, other. Um, yeah. So restitution would would be different than the restorative okay. component. Okay. Resti you know, if somebody broke the glass in the door. Right. Restitution may be that that student helps some does some kind of community piece. You know, helps with a classroom activity or something, or or, or helps repair it. Right. Um, you and then the restorative ideal. practices sort of umbrella is the umbrella over all of these. Yeah. So restorative practices is really about um, what happened, <laughs> um, what what would you do differently next time? How were people affected by what happened, as opposed to you did wrong, and you need to have a response to that. There's still a consequence and a response um, to that, and that's where the code of conduct, the discretion piece, come in. Um, does that help? It is. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up is uh, Ms. Malbezzi. Hi there. I'm Celeste Malbezzi, one of the associate principals at the high school. And I, I do have one long change, which was the code of conduct, which I think you were referencing. But um, for those of you who have been here a few years, uh, this is a short list for the high school, so I'm hoping to sort of breeze through some of it and then spend a little bit more time on that. I assume there'll be uh, some more questioning there. Um, the first one I think that you'll meet in the, in the handbook um, is around credits and promotion. If it's okay, I actually just want to skip over that one because I want to give that one a little bit more attention as well to explain what was behind that. So um, there was just a few others, uh, pretty basic. Um, one was under the section of military recruiters, um, and you know it was referencing no child left behind, and um, there has been 
uh, you know, that's shifted a little bit in terms of um, how students can um, opt out of having their information given to military recruiters. So at the high school level, military recruiters can come in and, and request students' information, telephone number, contact information, that kind of stuff. Um, and we are obligated to give that. Um, in, the, in the act that was, uh, had been previously and was left in there um, beyond uh, its end date, uh, was that students could themselves, students or their parents or guardians, could opt out of that uh, by notifying um, the school, the LEA, which would be the high school. Um, this new, um, the new law that was signed in by President Obama um, shifted that slightly saying that only parents or guardians could initiate opting out or students who had reached uh, 18 years of age. Um, and in addition to that, the request had to be in writing. So some minor changes there, but I just wanted it to be updated in the handbook. So that's what that is. Nothing that we have any control over, so, and no questions there, I doubt. Okay. Um, athletics, uh, we added, uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to add girls ice hockey as a winter sport uh, through a co-op with Longmeadow High School. So that was added. And then um, uh, Karen jarvis Vance gave us some information about the scent reduced environment, and I put that in our handbook. Yes. And I believe that that is a, um, uh, a request for voluntary cooperation. But still. So those are the smaller things. That's a, like I said, that's, uh, that's minimum. That's, that's minimal for us. Um, so if we can jump backwards again to the credits and promotion. And um, I just want to be able to explain a little bit about why that change. Um, it's a very small change in the handbook in terms of the space it takes up. But I think, um, you know, there was a lot of thought behind it. And I worked with the school council on that, and so I want to give it a little bit of, of uh, attention. So um, if you were able to, or remember, or can reference the old promotion policy, it was along the lines of a student um, needs seven credits to be able to be promoted to be a sophomore, 14 to be a junior, and then 20 to be a senior. And the reasons for that is that students need uh, 28 credits to graduate in the high school. Most students who uh, are passing their classes along the way, you know, typical matriculation, they are going uh, to earn 32 credits, eight per year. And so students have four credits. Every student uh, who's with us for four years has four credits of wiggle room to play with. And the issue, um, or one of, one of the issues, is that students who, um, you know, they were being retained before they met that threshold. Really, so a student who maybe you know had a rough start freshman year, who only earned six out of their eight credits, was then retained, um, and was held back as a freshman. Um, so, you know that that presented uh, a lot of issues, and it has, for sort of all of time, I think, in schools. You know, it complicates things, um, but it's just one of those sort of rules or rules of thumb, really, that you don't have enough credits, you don't go to the next grade, and you know, as if that's sort of a, a motivator of such or, or you know, I, I'm not even sure, really, as I was digging it deep into it, I'm not really sure what the reasons were. I can tell you what some of the challenges were. Um, you know, well, a huge one is that we know full well that students who are retained freshman year, um, you know, the likelihood of them graduating from high school is less than not. So there's a big one right there, and I don't have the exact figures, but I don't need to because I think it's, we, we all know that. Um, the second reason is MCAS. So students who was retained freshman year is held back as a ninth grader for a second time, or really, it's certainly a student that's struggling one way or the other, um, and that student loses an opportunity to take the MCAS because you technically can't take the MCAS as a ninth grader. And so they're considered freshmen again. So, and I, that might sound confusing because it might seem like, okay, you're a freshman and that means you have sophomore, junior, and senior years still to take it. But the reality is at the high school is that we find with the right supports that students are able to either earn back that credit or make up credit. And we actually have very few students who um, do not meet, who stick with us, who do not meet the 28 credit requirement over four years. Um, so for example, a student who might have gone over the attendance requirement as a freshman and lost credit because they were absent too many days. Well, uh, you know, I oversee that. And, and there's not one student that I haven't given the opportunity or at least put out there the opportunity to meet with me, let's come up with a contract, and if your attendance improves, you have an opportunity to earn that back. 
you know. So um, what was happening, which is another one of the bullet points of why this is a challenge, is that students are retained, and then they're promoted, and then they're right on the fence, and then something happens, and then they're retained, and then mid-year they're promoted, and it's a clerical nightmare for one, and it's also in terms of uh, reporting to DESE, it's really, you know, it gets complicated because they're moving their year graduation and all that kind of stuff. Um, hold on, I did have more bullet points. Oh, information dissemination. So we actually don't do a lot in the high school that's grade level based. You know, we don't, we have home bases, but that's like a total of, you know, 15 minutes a year really that you're in there and that's to get your report cards or something like that. So um, the one thing that we do do is we have uh, grade level meetings. So we use grade levels as a way to disseminate information, you know, guidance counselors, grade level meetings, um, and in that light that students might be retained and then earn their way back into their original grade, um, they're often missing important information along the way because they're going in there and walking in with, you know, a freshman class or sophomore class when they will likely end up as a, you know, sophomore or junior by the next year. So that's the other thing. And, you know, for a high school student, and I imagine, you know, I, I can only speak for high school students, uh, it's in my experience that having to go to a freshman grade level when your peers are sophomores um, is embarrassing, you know? And to be, uh, to not be promoted, to be retained, there's a really a profound sort of sense of failure that goes into that. And um, so that's really, that was the motivator. That big, you know, uh, why are we doing this? This is not helpful. And what happened with a friend of mine, Melissa Power Green, one of her students, um, a few of her students she shared with me had said, you know, Ms. Power Green, how do, I, how do I request to not be in the yearbook? And I said to her, no, they don't have to buy the yearbook. And she's like, no, Celeste, you're not getting it. Like, they don't want to be in the yearbook because they're going to be in there listed as a ninth grader when they're supposed to be a tenth grader or as a junior instead of being a senior. And I was like, oh. So that's never, I, that, I've never heard of a student not wanting to be in the yearbook. And it makes perfect sense. It's just not you know, you, sometimes you don't think through all the ripples of decisions that we make. And so I thought, you know, what's, what's the point? These are the students that, what, we think we're motivating them by putting out these numbers that don't mean anything to them. You know, it's sort of like even, you know, by the end of the year, I'm like, yeah, you, you know, they're like, why am I still in this grade? I'm like, remember we told you over and over, you need this many credits. Like, it's not certainly having, <laughs> It's not serving the purpose that we intended by any stretch. So given all the challenges and the fact that, uh, you know, it's not, we're not gaining anything of, from it and, and, and I think we're actually causing harm by doing it, uh, we wanted to shift to a policy where, um, you know, you spend your first year in high school in ninth grade, your second year in tenth grade, third year in eleventh, and if you need more time as a senior, um, you know, to meet your graduation requirements and you can be a senior as many times as you're allowed to be in high school. So that was the, uh, that's the, was the goal of that. That's what, uh, where it came from. And, um, you know, and, and I did share with some, some of those same students that that was the direction we were hoping to move in. And, you know, I, it was a, a sense of relief and appreciation. So I'm hopeful that, uh, that the committee agrees with that. And then the code of conduct. So I think, um, you know, uh, Lonnie, what you were saying is, plays really into the changes that we made. Yeah. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the first page of the Code of Conduct, sort of the information, the preamble or of such is, uh, is very similar. Um, and it was last year, I believe, that as a district um, that we added the common language around um, and then the line, it might be just a tiny bit different here, what I'm reading, um, the new one than what was, bef what was in there last year, but um, it was common language around using discretion, around taking into consideration, you know, that list of students' age, disability, all those things. So that was last year. That okay. was a shift that we made as a district. Okay, yeah. Um, and so we're certainly, you know, I feel good about the direction that we're moving in, and, um, you know, the, the JFK has been using um, restorative practices, and it's looking into PBIS, and the high school even, uh, uh, myself and another staff member have been um, sort of investing in uh, collaborative problem solving as an approach um, to working through discipline and, and other matters in the high school. And so uh, basically, if I'm honest, uh, 
I handle the discipline primarily at the high school and I, and I really rarely if ever you know oh you skipped your class let me see page whatever is this your first time or second time and going down and trying to track what that is I just it's that's the way it really happens it's not practical and, and I think I feel like I'm at a point where you I you can't have it both ways I can't use be able or be expected to or want you know want to use discretion in all these other ways and have something that's sort of this thing in the back of my head well if I don't do this someone's going to point out you know well it says very clearly this is what happens you know it's sort of um, you know sometimes I feel like my hands are tied and which side should I err on um, and, and I think what I would like to be able to do or I well, I guess I'd say what I have been doing and what I'd like it to be okay for me to do uh, by all accounts is to um, you know to a situation comes up to be able to look at the situation um, look at the students involved be able to assess assess sort of you know um, what the issue is and what the problem is and you know hopefully collaboratively be able to come up with a solution that makes sense for everybody involved you know I uh, I think as a district we are uh, you know we all believe that we're educators first and that that's the business that we're in and um, you know if I if I felt strongly that um, you know that some of the consequences that being punitive that just throwing out you know first offense second offense is a detention you know if I felt like that was working I, I might feel differently but um, you know I, I I'll be it's on my to-do list before school starts is to really dig into our discipline data but um, without doing that I can tell you that even at the high school and even in um, when I think we do a fine job at, at dealing with situations um, and looking at them holistically and looking for good solutions um, you know there's some dis major discre discrepancies absolutely uh, around students of color around students with different socioeconomic um, those with challenges socioeconomically uh, students with disabilities even ELL students are gonna be the top on the list and um, and so I'd like to be able to focus on that and not feel sort of restricted by the, uh, you know, first offense, second offense, third offense. So that's really what that's about. So any questions uh, about the high school policy? Yeah. Yes. So I thank you for that. And, and again, I, it's, I, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing at the, at the JFK. I think just looking at the handbook, it seems such a contradiction to see this list of consequences when you have this more holistic approach. So it, I think it threw me off that JFK had this list, which didn't, it just didn't jive with how you approach things. And I, you don't have the list anymore. Yeah, that's the change. That's, so that's the change. And I would encourage just as a reader, and, I, and again, it's it, it, not that big a deal. It's really how you do things at JFK, but I would encourage you to consider just taking that list out next year. Because, yeah, okay, thank you. And thank you for that. And. Um, in, ter in terms of um, having kids socially promoted, thank you for that explanation. I, I'm sold, it makes sense. I'm just wondering whether you feel like there were kids in the past that worked harder because of the potential embarrassing situation of being retained in a classroom, in a class that they worked harder. I, you know what I'm saying? I can't, you see it in the movies a lot. I right. can't do this because I'll be back in ninth grade. So is that? potentially a concern and we yeah I mean that's so much harder to measure right and I yeah. and I think um, it's a question that comes up I'm always thinking about our attendance policy because I, you know, um, I enforce the attendance policy and I, I about its effectiveness as well um, and, you know I what I would say and the same thing with it with the uh, you know even with discipline it's sort of a, it's it all kind of to me fall in the same category so yeah. the same students who are absent a lot regardless of the policy are absent a lot the same students who, you know, have behavioral challenges, regardless of what the policy says, they have behavioral challenges. Yeah. Um, and the same students who are not doing well academically, um, you know, historically, they're the ones that are struggling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how much does that carrot help those on the on the fringe? It's hard to say. So, um, you know, that's the unknown factor right. for sure. Um, and, and really when I think about attendance, to me that's like everyone knows about it, get nine absences, students ask, and I say, if, you know, if I just take it out, then I am afraid that for that, the group that it does work for, yeah. that I'll see an, an increase in absences for them. And right. so that, that is my struggle, and I think it's, 
Um, I think in all these sort of big categories, it's this, it's the same. And yeah. so it's sort of well, yet to be seen. You'll say, yeah. Something to, to pay attention to. Right. But I, I really feel like we spend a lot of time on, um, on talking about and implementing differentiating instruction, you know, and uh, we talk a lot about uh, accommodating students with um, disabilities, IEPs, and 504s, and we've also talked a lot about social emotional. Uh, students and the rise in the district and what are we going to do and um, you know but we're still acting on a code of conduct that's that doesn't jive with that so right that's the, that's the motivation in terms of in terms of the, the switch to um, social promotion if I would love for you to come back next year and just give an update on that and just say whether it, it had any impact potentially on school dropouts or on, or on discipline or on just feedback from students I think they would be the ones to ask. You know, we did this last year. Is it working for you? Are you more motivated? Did we make a good choice? And I'm still, I mean, the like data will still be there because I'll still be able to yeah. track the credit. Sure. Great. Just, yeah. Great. Thank you. Any Mr. Meyer. I have a question about the, the lack or the removal of the table because I'm just wondering without that table, how do I, as a student or as a parent of a student, know whether my student's punishment is where is falling on the continuum and whether I'm being treated similarly to other students who are similarly situated because again you mentioned students of color and I think one of the things behind 222 mm -hmm. was that those students for a variety of reasons were usually receiving harsher punishments longer suspensions mm -hmm. and I guess that I understand that you know obviously the discretion is built <laughs> into the system and I understand that you know a lot of times, the obscenity used in the classroom never gets to the administrator because the teacher has discretion as to, as to how to deal with it in a classroom situation. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, without those guidelines, there's no, uh, there's no way to know. Where are the checks and balances, you know, really? Have you devi again, you know, to use it as sentencing guidelines, you can deviate downwards, you can deviate upwards, and then you usually have to make an explanation for that. But at least it gives everyone going in some sense of where they are. And I'm wondering how, how is that going to work, since obviously you can't share that information across disciplinary events and between students, so it stays in that compartment. I, you know, I as a student receive a punishment that's relatively harsh, but I have no way of knowing that. Um, and especially if I'm from a, you know, a community that has been historically treated more harshly I have no way then to seek a remedy or to accumulate evidence of that. Yeah, I think that's a valid question. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, what I can say is the intent, you know, I can only talk about my intention, really. And so the intent is, is to actually to err on the side of protection of the students that, that you're concerned about or that, you know, your, that your question right. can, uh, raises concern about. Um, so, you know, I, I guess um, I can only speak for myself and, and that, you know, having a lot of uh, conversations, I mean, we involve families and, um, and sort of share what we're doing along the way. Um, we, you know, we, it's hard, we, we can't share. You know, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes you can feel really frustrated that you can't share sort of a consequence that you dished out to explain something. It's amazing though that uh, just because I'm not sharing it, I'm pretty sure everybody knows everybody's consequence across the high school. So um, somehow parents are still always calling, what about so-and-so and you did this? Um, but yeah, I, you know, I don't mean to make light of it. It really, it, it's a question and I think something also to pay attention to. Now, um, do you think there's sufficient, you know, you talked about looking at the data, which is really important for, you know, for someone in your position, for all administrators and teachers also to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's sufficient record keeping so that your summary data would show, for instance, for this particular infraction, there's a really broad range of consequences and we need to understand why that is? Or, you know, and I don't, I don't even know whether you look, when you aggregate the data, you code it with any kind of identifying factors to say, well, you know, here are you know, students with um, economically disadvantaged and here's students of, of color mm -hmm. so that we might or you know here's male female so that yep. you could actually look at the data and get some information from it yep. again because if you don't add those codes it, you you can't see whether you're affecting one group disproportionately right yeah no 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 we we do have the capability of doing that dr. Provo I was just strengthening that, but I think it's more than capability it's requirement Oh. Because at the end of the year, you have to do the SSDR report, right. and any of the infractions that fall in those categories have to be broken out 
into those categories. Um, so my, I guess my presumption in reading the handbook was the absence of the list would not stop you from coding the, the infractions the same way you have been. Is that oh, right. correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. but that report covers, it only covers consequences that reach the level that the state considers significant enough to report. We report so, on everything now. So, but, but I'm saying you report on even, for instance, return to class without discipline. If it's coded, I, I believe everything gets. Because, I mean, I, my, my question. I don't know what they look at. Yeah, it's my a different question. Is, if things are consistently deviating downward for one student group, for one group mm -hmm. of the population, that that's invisible. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, again, if you're being fair to one group, but more than fair to another group, you know, sort of that's the invisible dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moore. Yeah, I, I think I, I, my first observation is that, you know, the use of these discipline grids has not prevented um, those kind of deviations. Oh, yeah. In fact, <laughs> and it, but it hasn't exposed those kind of deviations either. It, what's required to is, is the kind of record keeping you're talking about. Because whether you have that grid or not, people have still found ways to be very discriminatory in their discipline and to get away with it for long periods of time. So, you know, I don't think the grid matters particularly in terms of that issue. Uh, you, uh, you know, in other words, the grid does not enforce fairness. Um, and, I, and I think actually getting rid of the grid is pretty good in terms of instead of having the sort of facade of all we do is call balls and strikes here, right? Um, we get rid of that facade and say, no, actually, we're calling balls and strikes here, you know? <laughs> um, and there is a substantial amount of judgment um, involved. And I, and I think, so I think that's actually beneficial in terms of making it be a, more true to what the process really is. And I think that's the other key thing is that for the biggest sanctions, there is a process which is laid out. And I think it's really important that that process be Honored and, and clearly, if you there's no point to the process if the if the consequence is predetermined by the offense, right? So so it's so so in fact, having a process or having a grid, it seems like the process is a much better tool, and um, and actually m makes not only the grid not useful, actually the grid is actually contrary to a, a good process. Well, again, though, I think some of that, before the state reported, private parties accumulated the suspension data. So it yes. Like, so it was, it, it is important. Yeah, the data is the key thing, regardless of how you do it, in order to find the bias. And of course, even within that, how you record things and how you see things can be biased in such a way that the data can't show it. I think more importantly, <laughs> you know, the work that we're, that we're doing as a district, you know, and, and we're lined up for anti-bias training in, in the beginning of school, I think it's, you know, my personal worry is not, is not, and I know these are the checks and balances, right? But for me, my intentions and my personal worry is not about that I will be issuing discipline or consequences unfairly, certainly have the data, and, and I'll want to be keeping track of that. And, you know, I mean, we're not immune to things like that. But, um, you know, why, why are, uh, why are the majority of the students who show up in my office with discipline refer referral students of color? Or, you know, I mean, that's really where the work needs to be done. I mean, we, you know, if we want to really talk about that, we need to push it way, way back. You know, by the time they get to me, um, I feel like that's the motivation is sort of giving me the flexibility because I, you know, when I have to call Dr. Provost because I, you know, had to, uh, emergency suspend a student and I'm like yeah two students and and by the way they're both african-american and uh, you know that sucks um, so I really feel like um, you know I'm looking for flexibility to be able to work with students and to be able to work with faculty and um, you know and and the rest of my the administrative staff kind of around having that options of using other things and not feeling um, you know part of that I think having the um, sort of what's the protocol or the you know the typical or the the expected consequence um, is that we're also battling ourselves and uh, and my colleagues you know around what do I do it says that we should do this you know and there's this sort of um, 
I don't know, pull to uh, am I going too lenient or the staff are not happy because it says you should do this, but, you know, Celeste only did this, and so she's not holding them accountable. You know, I mean, it really, um, you know, I, I, I would like to be able to do my thing. That's what I think I'm hired to do. I think I do a pretty good job at that and, um, and to keep track of the data and, and make sure that it's working. And if not, come back and revisit it. But it's, it's, a, it's definitely valid. We have to pay attention. Ms. Burnham. Just a quick um, thank you for your uh, profound description of all of this. Um, I think that just one of the things to think about is, um, is that in a way we're sort of the document feels like it's multiple things. It's, um, and to think of what the goal of the handbook is. And that we, you know, I think that a grid um, does what Downey is saying. I think that it does what <laughs> Howard is saying. But, um, you know, a grid makes it really easy for parents to read. And, um, and if part of the goal of a handbook is to communicate with parents, um, you know, I mean, there is, you know, like the section of what the what might happen to your student is embedded pretty far down. And I feel like something that we return to a lot is how do we communicate with parents so that they're prepared for what things are going to happen. And even in high school, parents need to still be really, I mean, are, are <laughs> and Absolutely. need and yeah. we want them to still be engaged. So I guess as like a reader, as somebody who's reading this document, I think that a grid works on another, um, level. I appreciate that you're talking about not wanting to be held to something and I, I really understand that and um, I think that you know we could we're all victims of that in our own lives and with our children. <laughs> um, so you know and also it's a document to help parents understand what is happening in the schools. So just to think about how can maybe there's I mean, maybe you do bullet points instead of at right. some point yep. you know how do you make this stand out. Um, I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done in this. I think as a high school student and, you know, talking to some of my peers, we get the handbook on that first, like, home base day, and we don't always see all that thought and the work that goes into it. So I'm going to be doing my best to translate these changes and the thought that's gone into it to the student union and to as many students as I can, and I'm hoping maybe we can find some way for you to talk to the students um, to share all of that work that went into it um, so it can be more of a living document among the students, too. So Great. thank you. I appreciate that and your help in developing that. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we've now heard presentations on the elementary uh, JFK and high school student handbooks for 2017-2018. And I would entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion on the 2017-2018 student handbooks. Second. This would be a vote to approve the handbooks. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so they are approved. Um, next, we have an item. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Next, we have an item um, a budget transfer request uh, $62,060 uh, to create an NHS math position. And I'll ask Dr. Provost to please present that since he's also the uh, school business administrator tonight as well. <laughs> uh, in your packet, you'll find a memo from Brian Lombardi as well as a transfer request. This um, essentially is transferring funds um, for our current employee from the special education line items within the high school cost center to this regular education line items within the high school cost center. The reason that's necessary is because an English teacher has resigned. We have a special education teacher who's dual certified. The other certification is English. The recommendation from the high school administration is to transfer that special ed teacher into the English position and then to use the money that was in the special education, in special education position to create an additional math position. So this would be a, a transfer to take the money from the special ed account, which will no longer be necessary because special ed teacher will be in the English position, and transfer it into a math teacher's line item. Okay. Any questions about that? 
tried to make a motion. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Right. So the I just want to make sure I understand this clearly. The English teacher will be the special ed teacher will move into the English teacher's position, and the special ed funds will turn into a math teacher. And then what will happen to that special ed teacher's position? Just there, that's no longer. Has the administration kind of? Go ahead. Yeah, that was my first question as well. Um, as the administration looked at caseloads for that position next year, um, it's not really a, a position that we're expecting to carry a full caseload. Um, if you look at some of the prior year's MCAS scores, I think one of the things you'll notice is that students with disabilities as well as non-disabled peers are getting almost to the point of 100% proficient and advanced in um, ELA. Not the same story in math. Um, so there is a greater need in math, and when this opportunity came up, the administration said, rather than continuing to fund a position where the need isn't as great and the caseload really probably isn't going to justify a full-time position, to move those funds over to provide more support in math. Okay. I make a motion on the budget transfer in the amount of $62,060 to create a North High School math position. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next item on the agenda is a vote to a, uh, award a winning bid. You're things. skipping me deliberately. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I'll make apologize. it really short. I apologize. I apologize. I, I apologize. My pen was sitting on top of the report. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, we will have a report from our colleague on her, uh, on her participation in the MASC Summer Institute 2017. I've presented this long Thanks. Um, so I was able to go to the, it was a two-day conference um, that was held in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Um, and I have to be honest, um, I know that we have all sat through meetings where you're watching the clock or you're thinking of all the things you could be doing with your time, but this was by far the most informative, interesting two-day seminar I've ever been to, and I hope that if they do it again next year that some of you will join me. I think it was the first year they've done it, um, but it was really well done. So I just wanted to talk to you briefly about one of the sessions I went to because um, I think in some time in the near future, it will be something that we'll want to discuss as a committee. For now, it's just kind of to give you the heads up, and um, I will get the slides from the presentation form to um, Laura, the school clerk, to send to all of you tomorrow so that you can see some of it. Um, the one that was most interesting was on school accountability, and it was understanding state and federal rules. And so it was the most comprehensive overview I've had. I know some of you have been on the committee longer, probably had a better grasp of it, but they essentially covered all of the state and federal statutes, regulations, and rules that have led to where we are right now. Um, they started with um, the Basic Skills Improvement Policy of 1979 as far as Massachusetts statutory history all the way up to the Every Student Succeeds Act. And then as far as the federal um, statutory, they started in, gosh, way further back than that. Um, with um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 and all of its iterations. Um, and it essentially tried to separate out um, what, what are we doing, why are we doing it, what are we doing because it benefits the students, and what are we doing it because it's, we have to comply with bureaucratic rules and regulations. Um, and it explored the um, benefits and the unintended consequences that policymakers should be aware of before um, determining future mandates and, and et cetera. Um, so I think that the most, the key points that I wanted to just kind of bring up to us were one, there was um, a really interesting discussion of school funding. The fact that we only get in Massachusetts, um, like for instance in the year 2014, we get 4.8% of our budget is from the federal government. Of that, only 1.1% is Title I funds. Um, and the rest is you know, school nutrition programs, vocational programs. And essentially they, there was the question of how are, they allow, how are they able to require so much of us when they're actually giving us so little? Is this something that we want to push back against under the new administration? And so that was one question that they kind of threw out there um, that I thought was very interesting. Um, and with that, they sort of talked a lot about test-based accountability and how that worked the positive aspects of it, the negative aspects of it. Um, 
and how that progress and performance index that they use to hold school districts accountable is so skewed. Um, for instance, for elementary and middle schools, um, the only information that is included in your and your um, performance index is from standardized testing. It doesn't take into account any of the other myriad of, myriad of ways that our districts are working to educate our students, et cetera. High schools have it a little better because they also, while they don't include the science standards, they do include graduation rates, dropout rates, um, dropout re-engagement. Um, and so they were kind of saying, like, think about it, your entire, you know, your entire um, academic and non-academic learning and engagement is excluded from any of this consideration when we're, you know, giving, talking about the success of our districts. Um, and they really broke down what it meant for these accountability performance levels. Um, I know we talk about it a lot, but I had never seen the state, really looked at the statewide numbers. And they're talking about, you know, how it certainly favors a district that's made up of one school they're primarily level one. It favors vocational schools because vocational schools are able to have entrance requirements for students and expulsion policies that are a little bit stricter than ours and how those would be the bulk of schools that you would see in, level, in the level one status. Um, but then they talk about, for instance, in a level two district, how arbitrary it becomes and it becomes like a really one size fits all methodology. So you can have two districts with um, an equal number of schools, like Winchester and Gloucester. Winchester has six schools at a level one and only one school at a level two. It's considered a level two district. Gloucester has one school at a level one and six schools at a level two. It's considered a level two district. And so they're saying, like, isn't this excessive labeling to be giving to schools? It's not giving us information. It's actually harmful in many ways. Um, and so it was really hoping, I think, to inform school committee members of you know, to really start us thinking about what what are we doing, what are we willing to put up with, and what are our priorities for change as far as pushing the legislator, legislature. Um, I think the most striking information that I did not realize was that as of 2015-16, there were three level five districts. Holyoke had, um, is the only district of those three level five districts that had actually has a level five school. So they've got 11 schools in their district, one was a level two, six were at level three, one at level four, one at level five, two with insufficient data, it's labeled, it went into receivership. But then you have a Lawrence that has 32 schools, 10 of them are at a level one, three at a level two, eight at a level three, four at a level four, seven with insufficient data, not one of them at a level five, went into receivership. And then you have a Southbridge with four schools, three of them are at a level three, one with insufficient data went into receivership. So what does that even mean, this punitive measure of the state putting schools into receivership when, how, is, how are they even considered equal? Um, and so it was really making us question the entire system that we've ended up with and explain how we got here. And the questions that they were starting to ask that weren't, they didn't, they didn't look for answers and obviously I don't think we need to discuss it now, but was kind of where do school committees in the state want to put their energy and focus? Do we want to focus on state or federal advocacy? Um, do we want to ask for a, a moratorium pending reforms? Um, do we want to end this excessive and arbitrary labeling like you see with all of the district levels? Um, are we using an appropriate volume of testing and is it appropriate in the, the ways that we're using it? Um, and, or do we want to restrict the, regulari the regulatory authority of state agencies? Um, would we like to implement strategies to control the educational bureaucracy from extensive overreach? Um, and they were just kind of looking for general ideas and direction, the executive um, board of MASC, um, for you know what's kind of the sense, what would make the most impact for, for school committees in their districts and what do they think their priorities are? Um, because right now it's kind of a unique opportunity with the, little, with the leadership transition at the state level with the passing of um, Mitchell Chester and then we're not getting much apparently from the federal level because many of the positions have not yet been filled so it sounds like a lot's on hold as far as um, they still have Obama level staff, Obama or staffers filling positions not sure what they're supposed to be implementing or doing because they're still waiting to hear what new policies will be implemented. So that was something to think about. I'll send you all the slides, and I'm assuming at some point we'll be presented with the opportunity to really weigh in at the state level for that. Um, and then the, uh, the only other 
fourth, the only other session I went to that I want to mention, and it's only because Karen Travis Vance is here, is that I went to a session, um, it was crafting a solution from the inside on opioids in schools, and it was of interest because I have been working as the liaison for the Prevention Coalition, um, and it was a three-part seminar um, put on by the Middlesex DA, and then the nurse from the Plymouth School Systems, and then a legal update, it was this most the first legal update they've done for the um, MASC on um, regarding opioid and marijuana laws, which they made three days before the seminar and was already considered out of date by the time we hit the seminar because the changes the Governor Baker made will affect it. Um, but essentially, you know, they said you really need to stay on top of this because the laws are changing, there's more litigation in the pipeline, et cetera, um, but that we were in good shape because we were so lucky to have Karen Jarvis fans, who apparently is considered a leader in the field, and I was so proud to be from Northampton because her name comes up, and people are like, oh, she's so great, and they talked about Espert, and how we were, it's now Espert this year, will be the first year it's required in all the schools, and Northampton piloted it, and largely, I think, in, um, so I fully expect that any changes in policy that needed to, need to be made, that Karen Jarvis fans will alert us to. Um, and uh, and it was very it was very nice to hear such positive things about our districts. So that's my report. Thank you very much. Any questions, uh, Ms. Fallon? Thank you very much for attending. The, um, the, now we resume the agenda. Uh, the next item is that bid award uh, for the lease of space at Northampton High School uh, for community uh, for cable access television. Dr. Provost. As you know, the committee voted to continue surplusing the space that's currently being used for community access television at Northampton High School. I can't say that it was a tremendously successful bid process. We only had one bidder uh, uh, who was NCTV wishing to continue um, working at the high school. I will say that it has been a good partnership between community access and the high school. I think it's created opportunities for our students and also enhanced the community. So um, there's here's the one bid. <laughs> okay. I'll make a motion on that bid award, the lease of space at Northam High School for cable access television. I would second that. Okay. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to award the lease uh, for space at the high school to Northampton Community Television. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. They may have cut us off if uh, we didn't approve that. <laughs> Jen, thank you, Jen. Uh, congratulations. Uh, so now we have a, uh, a job description that needs approval. This is for a technology integration specialist. And I just, Dr. Provost. I just want to look out in the audience for a little direction on this. Um, we, okay, um, this is a job description that I will say I should have brought up in my weekly meeting with the NACE president, but um, we had other things on our agenda, I apologize. However, I got it out to NACE and the teacher chapter coordinator to take a look at today and just got the thumbs up on it. Very minor changes, um, we're changing two bullets in the essential functions, I believe they're four and five, which have to do with assistive technology and IEPs, and also changing the second bullet in knowledgeability and skill, um, requiring the individuals to have understanding of universal design for learning. Both of, or I guess all three of these changes are consistent with what I had discussed at the last month's meeting about what we used to call assistive technology, more and more just being technology. Okay. I would uh, entertain okay. a motion. I'll make a motion on the job description, technology integration specialist. Is there a second? Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this new job description. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the job description is approved. Next we have a gift. This is from uh, Stephen Gaynor School. It's 22 used smart boards and projectors uh, to, the, to the district. Dr. Provost? I would just like to um, thank Stephen Gaynor School and our IT director, Antonio Pagan, for their hard work on this. Um, the 222 
or the 22 smart boards will be a good addition to our fleet of smart boards within the district. Antonio has arranged to have them delivered um, by a company that specializes in moving these um, types of equipment. If you recall, we had a similar donation a few years back and approximately 50% of them were in an unusable position condition by the time they got here so um, we are paying a little bit to have these moved but it's much less than the overall value of the smart boards and will be a good addition to the district okay. I make a motion to accept this gift to Stephen Rayner school 22 use smart boards and projectors to the district I'll second it any questions all those in favor please say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is accepted, and now we'll move on to a gift from Smith College. 38 study carols and 36 chairs for the district. Yes, as you know, Smith is renovating its library. Um, these are pieces of furniture from the current library that are no longer going to be needed. Um, these will be distributed all throughout the district. I believe just about every school and department requested one or two of the carols when um, they became available. I make a motion to accept the gift, uh, the Smith College gift, 30 study carols and 36 chairs to the district. Is there a second? Okay, motion's made and seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, next, a gift from Lowe's for $2,550 to Northampton High School for a bike share rack fencing. This has been a dream of Kate Dollard's for some time to create a bike share program for students of Northampton High School um, that probably should be or maybe will be another um, gift form at some point because my understanding is the bicycles are going to be donated by the Northampton Police Department. Um, probably the same fleet that goes into the auction from time to time. Um, students will be required to sign uh, an agreement which Joe Cook has helped to develop, basically saying if you borrow one of our bikes, we, you need to wear a helmet, I promise to wear a helmet. Um, and so the idea is that this will be a fleet of bikes that will be secured at the high school that will be a bit available for students to use um, as they want to. Okay. Make a motion to accept the gift in the amount of $2,550 to Northampton Heights School for the bike share rack fencing. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay. Next, we have a gift. This is from uh, the district attorney, and it is a gift of $2,250 to the Prevention Coalition. In your packet, you'll see that that amount is obtained by summing the two gifts from the, uh, the district attorney's office. There's one for $1,750, another for $500, both for the Prevention Coalition and for the work they do with substance abuse education. I'll make a motion to accept the gift from the district attorney in the amount of $2,250. Second. Second. Okay. Second by Mr. Moore. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we'll move into reports. Uh, we have the uh, several reports from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee on uh, various policy updates. So I'll turn it over to the Chair, Ms. Fallon. Um, so first up, we have uh, a new policy, for, um, it's policy ACB, non-discrimination on the basis of transgender and gender non-conforming status. Um, I watched the footage from last month. I know you all discussed all of these and asked your questions um, from Karen Jarvis Vance. Um, and this is a second reading and vote. It's a new policy, but it's really just putting into policy what we've already been practicing in the district for years. So. So if you'd like to make a motion. Okay, so I move that we um, move that we accept policy ACB. So. Got a motion made and seconded. Any discussion about the policy? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we can move on to the next. Uh, the next policy is also a second reading that we'll be voting on. It is uh, policy JLCD, administering medication to students. There have been a huge number of changes. While it is a revision, it is 
essentially a new policy <laughs> when you look at it. Um, and it was also discussed at length last month. I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Um, but I would make a motion to uh, revise policy, uh, to accept JLCD as revised. I'll second. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded. Any further? Oh, Mr. Moore. Yeah, I'd like to uh, offer an amendment um, to, actually it's a amendment, uh, to the first sentence um, un between the words under and request, I would uh, insert A. The word A. Okay. <laughs> uh, That's a motion, second. but nobody, somebody has to second it, so. I'll second. Okay. Okay, so there's been a second. So. Sorry. Like to the argument goes he wants the first sentence to have medication under, it currently reads may, medications may not be administered to students while at school unless such medicine is given to them by the school nurse acting under request with instructions for dispensing medication and I just think it reads better if you say acting under a request I respectfully disagree but Okay, well, so then you can you really have that there. You've already made your amendment. But you, you can discuss it. Well, I just, I thought it was better though, before you added the A, but I'm not going to argue over one letter. Well, we can vote. <laughs> we have a policy for grammar disputes. <laughs> Lawyer. Lawyer, is there a reason to have it under request instead of under a request? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. We could argue about A and N, but you know. It's one where you just call the question. And that yes. Okay. okay. So there's, yeah. been, there's yes. a motion made and seconded. The amendment uh, on the amendment. So um, all those in favor of the amendment say yes or A. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I. Um, wait, did we vote? I missed No, we're voting on the amendment. Call the ayes, and now those opposed, please say no. 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 Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. Wow, that's close. So we're gonna have a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we're voting chair. You get to say in this case whatever you want. What's that? Well, yeah. You're doing a voice vote. You're the chair. Well, I, it was very close. I could not hear. I missed the vote, and I was an I. So I had it. Okay. okay. So that that that, if that tips the, the scales. Had it, and that tips the scales for sure. Um, <laughs> so the amendment carries. We're now back to the main motion. Um, any other uh, questions or, or amendments on the main motion? Um, okay, hearing none, all those in favor of the policy as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so next. Okay, uh, the next is also a second reading and vote. Um, it is policy KHBE. It's a revision of a policy that would allow, that was um, based on the Northampton Booster Club's um, decision or desire to offer um, inside sign, ad in, uh, inside advertising to, um, to sponsors. Um, and it reflects that by adding in language for inside advertisement sign criteria. Um, and so I would make a motion that move that we accept the policy KHBE as amended. Second. Any uh, discussion on this policy? Yes. Just a quick question. Thank you, by the way, Laura, for doing all this. Seems like you're, this group does a tremendous amount of work. But um, <laughs> with this, uh, have you have you discussed whether these fees are still appropriate for 2017? I'm just curious. With you know, if we're looking at the same one, KHB dash E, right? So I'm just curious whether 250 and 750 is a real bargain, or whether that's something that we can consider raising. Um, Did you look into that? Really, I don't want to open the discussion. I was just curious whether you looked into what other. Well, I think that the, well because the 250 is a new number that that didn't exist before, so that that wasn't something that we should update. It was something that was kind of decided upon based upon the fact that they were smaller signs and hung inside, yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm assuming that that was something that they discussed at length. The amount. Yeah. Yeah. We did not, as a subcommittee, really get too much into the money issue of it. Dr. Brothers. The. $250 amount was really um, driven by the NABC annual sponsorship levels framework that they had set up. You look at the um, supporter level, which is the lowest level at which an inside banner becomes part of the premium. Yeah. 
we didn't want the NABC to lose 100% or more than 50% of their funding that they were bringing in by collecting more than $250 from them for selling the premium. So that's how that um, rate was set. The 750 is mm -hmm. um, the same as it has been for a long time. Yeah. We did make a change on that, though, because um, the last time we revised this policy, we had said that sponsors would receive a, a, a sort of continuation um, premium, if you will, and so it was 10% off every year, I believe. And all the sponsors we have out there, I think we're getting pretty close to 10 years <laughs> advertising. <laughs> it. So at this point, they're at Zero. free signing. Um, <laughs> so part of the reason for taking that out was to try to make those, um, those signage um, pieces that we currently have, um, once again, profitable for the district. Any other questions about this uh, policy? Okay, so you, you I moved. Howard seconded. Mr. Moore seconded. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, and then the last policy that we'll be voting on tonight is um, policy KHB R, uh, advertising in the school's delegation of authority, limitations, and restrictions. Um, this is obviously related to the policy we just approved and it has to do with um, the placement of signs of advertisements and commercial messages um, and that is really the primary change is on the first page under section 2 where it designates high school parking area, high school stadium seating and the high school gymnasium where we'll have signs on designated wall areas inside. Um, so I would move to approve policy KHBR as amended. Second. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Okay, and then last is um, the discussion and vote of a meeting schedule with the Student Advisory Council. Um, tell you what I thought we had decided and then we can figure out the rest of it. Um, so they, um, the plan is that we are to meet five times with the Student Advisory um, Council and that uh, we had talked about perhaps meeting every other month, um, October, December, February, April, and then May because June before our school committee meeting we do have a um, the retirement reception and in June the seniors will have either graduated or be otherwise checked out, I'm assuming. Um, so that was the tentative idea, was to meet those months. Um, and then the question was whether or not everyone was um, in agreement as to whether we should be adding um, this meeting on to the beginning of our already scheduled school committee meetings, scheduling to begin a half hour earlier than the meeting, um, at, or whether it should be at another time. Um, and Obviously, if we were to schedule it immediately before the meeting, uh, would it be it would would it be have a separate posted agenda um, than the regular committee meeting or be added on to the committee meeting? Um, and there, I think that the consensus of the subcommittee was that it would be simpler to have its own separate agenda um, and beginning and end time so that students could leave when they were done and not be forced to sit through another three hours of our meeting. Um, so I guess I'm looking for some guidance and I guess what people think about starting regular school committee meetings a half hour early, five times a year, or whether it should be on another night and if it should be another time, when would that be? Can I just add one more thing to that? My recollection of that subcommittee meeting was that uh, one of the thoughts was to have Mr. Lombardi be primarily responsible for drafting the agenda for that other meeting with the um, Student Advisory Council if we decide to go down that route. Right. Right, because, uh, sorry, go ahead, Lily. I was just going to say, because that, that was the thing that we kept having to emphasize was that it will be, because it is a meeting of the full committee with the students, it is a public meeting and it needs to be have a posted agenda and we need to have... Um, follow all the rules that we would during a normal school committee and so there was the thought that having 
Principal Lombardi work on the students to draft that agenda and make sure that it got posted um, would be best. Um, yeah, and I think also just some brainstorming might have to be done with the whole committee about what would be most helpful to you. I think like my motivation in discussing all this with you was number one, so that we're following the law because this is a Massachusetts state law. Um, and also for you know you guys to have more high school voices and in whatever capacity that is most helpful to you. Um, so whether it is you guys discussing items that have to do with NHS with us or if it's um, more in the form of those like reports and presentations that um, the committee sometimes hears from members of the school district. Um, just I, I, I would kind of love to hear like what you all would think would be most helpful. Comments, feedback, yes. Um, let's see, one, personally, I would pick starting the meeting early, personally. Um, and two, I feel because this is um, sort of a work in progress, um, I would love to know what the students would like to present to us at the high school. Since, you know, it seems like you guys have a lot to say and share and, and educate, and it would be really great, personally, to know what you would like before we make a formal decision. Yeah, I would second that as well. I think starting at 6.45 and going up to 7.15, our normal time, would be that 30 minutes and with a agenda planned ahead of time. I think a um, 30 minute meeting would probably be productive and be enough time. And again, it would be great for the high school students to, you know, as this evolves and uh, as Ms. Burnham just said, there may be some things that um, you all have been thinking about or will think about maybe to get the first few meetings started for sure those issues and thoughts that you have to share with us might be a very good starting point um, I wonder if it would be helpful to kind of have a, a regular structure sort of like our meetings do where we always do the same things in the same order um, and so you could do, I don't know how your, the composition of your group is going to be, if you're going to have a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior representative, or how you're going to do it, but you could do a brief report from each, and then if you wanted to have a discussion of an item or a presentation, put that separately, so that it's not just all, you know what I mean, so that you're not giving reports for the whole time, so there is the opportunity for interaction, but, you know, to kind of think of what, what you want the structure to look like, and then fill it in. As, as we go through each month, do you know what I mean? And then there's also the question of whether the student report that I normally give as your student representative during the regular scheduled meeting, whether that should then be moved to the earlier meeting or if you would like that to still be in the regularly scheduled full committee meeting. Uh, well, I guess now we're sort of stacking the questions, but um, the question of when to meet, I agree that we should meet before, we should start the meeting earlier. I'm curious about what the setup will be. Will we be televising it or will we have a separate meeting beforehand in the principal's conference room with the students and then I'll come in here to start at 7.15? I think there's different has to be a post it has to be posted. It has to post as a public meeting, but can't we have it in the library? I mean, are we going to be sitting in a semicircle? I mean, all of our subcommittee meetings are public meetings, but those don't happen in a semicircle. I'm just wondering with the students, where are the students going to be? Are they going to be in the front row? It'll be harder to, tele <laughs> it'll be harder to televise if we're in another row. So it has to be televised as a public meeting? It doesn't matter. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, food for thought. Um, I, I think it's very valuable to have your uh, uh, and present, presentation or comments at the beginning of our public meeting at 7.15 so that for folks who are watching that could watch. Um, anyway, I think it, I agree with Ms. Burnham, it's going to have to evolve in terms of the structure of what's useful. I'm not sure that presentations from every grade won't take up you know, that's 15 minutes right there. That won't leave a lot of time for discussion, so we'd have to sort of see how it, with just a half an hour to discuss issues. Um, I'd just like to say, like, regardless of whether my report is during that, like, high school meeting time or during this time, I will be staying.
for the whole meeting. <laughs> it's not like you're gonna lose me. <laughs> so it's just a matter of whether we like it would be logistically more reasonable to have my report at the beginning of that like yeah. six that like six forty five meeting. And then when I started sitting on this committee, like the the most helpful thing for me and what I found most interesting was watching those longer presentation reports from like people in the district who reported on like social emotional needs. And I think as a student union often what we're doing is for months at a time looking at one issue like AP testing or um, you know a bunch of different issues um, and doing like long-form studies on that and it might be really helpful for you for us to use that half hour to give a little presentation about those issues that we're looking at um, that's what I think would probably align most with what the student union does um, and also might be helpful for you yeah, I, I don't know that we have to decide that. No, I think that that was kind of the, the decision in some committee to let you guys work that out with Principal Lombardi um, as long as, and he knows to have these things posted. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think it can certainly evolve. And I think as long as we all kind of agree on the meeting time, that that would be helpful. <laughs> Just one last, I mean, I think that it's really nice to have a direction that you're starting with but to know that we are open to the direction that you guys want to go in. So if, you know, one meeting you want to, you're presenting on, a, on an issue that you're studying, that's great. And then if in the next meeting you want to talk about sports or, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, then do that. I mean, whatever, you, your, you have, you know, what you present to us is valuable. So I missed the last meeting, but I, un, until just now, I had somehow assumed that this was a subcommittee meeting. This was a subcommittee. So this is a different sort of idea. I, I think I'm reading into a little bit with what Rebecca said. I mean, I, I just think this would be a really intimidating thing for kids to come in this sort of form. So I would certainly, I would, I, I would encourage the idea of thinking through something else, even if we alternate somehow and making it more comfortable for the students. But I also would say that having it beforehand at 645, I would vote for that. And in terms of the value of, you know, I, I don't know how we can work this, but I like even today we were talking about like a, a different policy in terms of social promotion at school, right, on the high school handbook. Uh, I just would have loved if like, that was presented to you guys and you had an opportunity to talk to students and think about it as your group and then you being part of the discussion that we had as an example and i can i just think every day every meeting there's probably something that i personally and i think many of us probably could value if there was a student more of a student voice so i don't know if that's a role to play per se because you kind of have to know a little bit up front about what's going to be on the agenda and, and bring something to the table but you know we we discuss policies we present it and then we bring in a month later and to have student perspective on the policies that we're discussing to me, for me that would be really invaluable mm -hmm. just as an idea so I don't know if that's something that you guys are interested in doing yes and I think that will come from collaboration with Mr. Lombardi and Ms. Malvezzi and collaboration with the administration on that we do have monthly meetings with Mr. Lombardi where I think the the agenda for this school committee meeting will be worked out and we'll, we always discuss things that are going on in the school policy changes I and mean, then I think collaborating with them a bit into like translating that student voice to the committee will be really helpful yeah. um, just a question in terms of setting the agenda does that need to be um, approved like by like Ms. Judd's clerk or like when we set an yes, agenda <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's just, well, we have to meet the open meeting law requirements, so okay. we usually have a meeting, the superintendent and I and the vice chair and Ms. Judd to put together the overall agenda, so we'd probably just ask you to submit it at some point prior to that. Yeah, just like communication about like the dates and when we need to be su that submitted by would be helpful. 48 hours. 48 hours, thank Dr. you. Dr. Provost. Well, more than I, I, I agree with what Ms. Buzanski said about we're really stacking questions deep now. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if there may be, I'm going to offer what could be a shorter path. The first, so we could make it two questions. One is, is it the wish of the committee to have Mr. Lombardi sort of take the first crack at creating this agenda and then sending it to the agenda setting meeting? And if so, other than it can't be more than 30 minutes, are there any other things that you want to prohibit him from putting on the agenda?
Yes. No. I mean, I feel like he could. They could decide something, and right. if it doesn't mean anything. If it, we have no impact on it, then we'll have no impact on it. But if they feel like we need to hear it, then that's my opinion. Okay. And I would think the opposite of what should go on with Lonnie's point is, is if, if um, I don't know how quickly you guys can organize because the, the agendas for us aren't posted until 48 hours before. But um, but if if you had any you wanted to have any input into those agenda items, it would be great if that was on the agenda for this for the, for the student council meeting. But wouldn't they have that opportunity by having a go? Because if it's every other month, they might not necessarily. Because exactly. I was going to say, if they see that, if they're able to hear what we talk about on the first reading, they would be able to input on but the second reading. No, but they won't align if it's every other also, month. I am still here. Yeah, yeah, she's still here. Yeah, I'm still yeah. sitting at every meeting. Discuss it. Right? No, I just when yeah. 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 So anyway, so to the extent possible, it would be really great. Right. So I am here at your monthly school committee meetings, and to inform you a little bit about my process. Um, we have a student union meeting the Wednesday before each Thursday school committee meeting. Um, so I always have the agenda by it by then, and I go over it with our student union, like item by item, and we discuss things that like we might have questions about or we might bring up. Uh, so I do have the opportunity to talk to my student union before each month's meeting. So anyway, so that might be part of your process, except again, the 48 hours, you'd have to start it a little sooner in terms of posting it on your agenda. I'm talking more about just like the student representative, yeah. not like the student I understand. <laughs> when you say anything to prohibit them, the one thing that I would say is I don't know how well versed they are in the open meeting law, but they need to know, understand that if it's not on the agenda, it's not a topic of discussion. And so if one, if one thing brings up another topic, it can't, they can't have us engaging in a discussion about something that wasn't posted on the agenda just because it's sort of related. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just something we have to be careful of. So I don't know if who would maybe give a quick overview of open meeting law to students. I, 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 I did I not. I would love to do that. Oh, Yay. I think that would be great. <laughs> and I'm certain that Mr. Lombardi will be very helpful in this process. Okay, okay so should we, should we move to Add the school add um, to start the school committee meeting at 6:45, a half hour early every other meeting, um, and have those put on the calendar for October, December, February, April, and May. Second. Okay. I would like to. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I would I would like to amend that to be um, 6:35 or 6:40. Because I think actually by the time you do that and do the transition, that half an hour is just too short. Though. So I'm going to offer six uh, six thirty-five. Okay. Six thirty-five. We just make it six thirty. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to do it, I'm sorry, people. It, saying six thirty-five. Nobody seconded this thing yet. Yeah. So. I mean, if we need to make it earlier, I would just say six thirty to seven, and then we or whatever it is, and then have a little break. But sure, I would change my amendment to six thirty. But I still haven't got a second. Second. <laughs> okay. So there's been a, uh, an amendment to change the time from 6.45 to 6.30. Discussion about that. Thoughts? My only... Well, yeah. I, I have no problem with that. My only question would be to everyone, at different times of the year, getting here at 7.15 is hard, whether it's a sport or other job. Is that possible for people? I guess, I'm just curious. I guess I was thinking of this as a, not a subcommittee meeting, and I understand the law says we need to have a quorum of school committee meet school committee members, but as a separate meeting in a way, right? Separate mm -hmm. agenda, separate meeting. So if we have it from, I'm on board with starting at 6:30. I think that gives us some wiggle room. But um, if some people couldn't attend from 6:30 to 7, that's as long as we have a quorum. We're right. clear we have a quorum. We're okay. Mm -hmm. We're we're meeting the requirements of the law, and we're you know doing what we to do and I think we all would like to be here and sometimes we won't have to be we won't be able to be and that would be okay yeah that's how I that's how I've been envisioning this meeting with the student advisory council it's sort of a, not just less not I guess it's just semantics not starting the meeting earlier but it's a separate meeting with the student advisory council followed by the regular school mm -hmm. committee meeting at 7 15 that's how I've been thinking about it in my head okay I'm also wondering if, um, as is the case with our 
monthly meetings. Uh, some are longer and some are shorter. So if um, there is an agenda that might be shorter um, for whatever reason, um, would there could there be an opportunity to move it to a 645 time instead of a 630? And especially on an evening where um, we may have a very lengthy agenda, um, I'm all for a little break, you know, uh, at 6.50, but waiting until 7.15 and kind of burning 25 minutes knowing that we may have been able to use that to kind of get us out at a more reasonable time. I'd hate to find ourselves caught in that situation. So I'm not sure if there's a way to create some flexibility there, not taking any away any of the time that we would be interacting and having the conversation with the high school students, but there may be a light business agenda one month, and if there is, perhaps we could look at just adjusting the time. Yeah. It'd be a 15 minute break, not a 25 minute break. It would feel right. like a 25 short minute break. To you, yeah. it might feel like a 25 <laughs> yeah, right. minute break. Understood. Just Understood. Okay. Okay. Yes, Dr. Provost. This thought just occurred to me when Mr. Zowski was talking about nights when we have long agendas. One of these is going to line up with a month where we have two meetings anyways for the budget. That budget meeting is usually shorter. Maybe during that month we should aim to have this one be synced up with the budget meeting rather than the regular meeting. So do we do we say which February meeting it was or we just said a February meeting? We just said, uh, we just named a month. A month, so I wasn't sounds like specific. sync up with whatever we want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question before us is whether we want to start this joint meeting with the advisory council at student advisory at six thirty, uh, presumably to seven, or and then stick with it. Our regular meeting starts at seven fifteen. Yeah. Can I think Ted's point? I mean, I, we, sometimes we've had executive sessions that were scheduled before the regular school committee meeting, and those times have just been set by. By the agenda setters, who have just made an estimate as to how long that executive session should probably take, and have set we've had we've had sometimes at 6:30, sometimes at 6:45, you know, depending on what the business was, and um, so I wonder if, if that maybe is a sort of what you were saying a better approach, and in terms of guidance, say somewhere in there 6:30, 6:45 as a starting time, but based on um, Whoever is making the agenda for this meeting, which sounds like is sort of initially the high school administration and the student union, um, with then submitting that to our regular agenda setting people who are going to then be responsible for posting. Um, and so maybe, maybe rather than having a time certain, we should be setting it at the discretion of the various folks who have input into the agenda. I just, I feel like I could talk to Philip. The time ends, so you didn't feel like you were wasting your time. Like, if, if we're looking like we're going to finish early, I could just talk more. So that That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> um, no, just teasing. <laughs> but, I mean, the other thing to keep in mind, the other thing to keep in mind, and I'm sure this happened when we had an executive session before the meeting, was that if you're hosting the meeting to start at 7.15, it doesn't have to start at 7.15, you know, if it, if it go, so if you, oh. if you start your student advisory at 6.45 and it goes five minutes past, it's not like we turn into a pumpkin, like that meeting just goes longer and the school committee meeting starts five minutes later. You just can't start any earlier, so to Ed's oh, point, if you build in an extra 15 minute cushion, you may be sitting here, we may be sitting here at Stuff. five after waiting for, because we can't start any earlier than 7.15. Yeah. Okay. We can definitely start after yeah. 7.15. Let's do 6.45. Okay. So I think that that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I also just like to keep this as simple as possible. I think like <laughs> yeah. we are a group of high school students, and I don't know if you want to be trusting like our time estimates. Um, and one thing to my experience is like I never know what we as a committee are going to find really interesting and spend a really long time talking about, or no time at all. Um, so I'm in favor of just picking one time and having that be the time. Okay. Well, then I'll call the question on my proposed amendment. 
which okay. is 630. Okay. So the amendment now is to start the advisory meeting at 630. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. All those opposed, say no. 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 It's really <laughs> close. Wow. Five hats pretty much half. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Can we pose the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so the question is the amendment is to change the time from 6.45 to 6.30. Okay. So to start 15 minutes earlier at 6.30. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as opposed to 6.45. No. Ms. No. Ms. Moore? Yes. Mr. Moore? No. Mr. Moore? No. 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 Failed. Yes. Okay, so the amendment fails. So we're back to the motion, which is um, 6.45. Um, again, knowing we have wiggle room after uh, we don't have to start right at 7.15 if we don't want to. Um, so all those in favor then of adopting the meeting schedule of the Student Advisory Council, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So <clears throat> that completes our uh, vote on rules and other policies. Uh, now we'll move to the Business Administrator Report, which will be delivered by Dr. Provost tonight. Yes. The closing of books for the year, one of the biggest and most complicated business reports of the year, will be delivered by... <laughs> 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 so uh, the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the final line in your Munis report. You can see that it's a zero. At a very high level, that's one of the things that superintendents take a look at that want to make sure, and committees I think should look at, making sure that all the money budgeted for the year was spent. And that's, I think, the most, the first important piece for closing of the books. Second, um, I'll get into revolving accounts. School choice, interesting situation. We enrolled three more students than the prior year through school choice, but we'll net $127,000 less. Um, the reason for that is because the students we have in this year's choice cohort have lower special education associated costs than the students we had in last year's special education cohort. As you know, the tuition is $5,000, but if there are extraordinary special education costs beyond the $5,000, then the district gets actuals. So um, in a way, it should be a, a net no change um, because we have less reimbursement because we had less cost. However, um, our five-year projection on fiscal stability plan um, didn't anticipate reduction of $127,000. So we still think that we run out of money in the same year. The deficit is larger in that year. Um, we did do some things in order to try to mitigate that. Um, when we where the end of June and I had authority to spend um, down different accounts um, to get to zero, we charged more um, costs to the uh, remaining appropriated funds as opposed to choice um, so that we were able to save some of that money to move out into the out years. But remember, this is $127,000 that's multiplied by five over the course of, of the years moving out. Um, and also, we don't know what our special education costs in the choice program will be in future years. It's possible that that number may come up again. Um, but I just want to point that out. Second is circuit breaker. This will come as no surprise. Uh, we have more circuit breaker funding than we had originally budgeted for. We've been talking all year about having higher special education costs, which is one of the reasons why we had a partially frozen budget. Um, and when all is said and done, we ended up with $23,000 more in circuit breaker funds than were put in the FY18 budget. So at some point in the year, we will be asking the committee to amend the budget up to include those circuit breaker funds, um, which we have to spend within a year and a half of receipt of the funds. Next, athletic revolving was 
basically a status quo kind of situation. They began, um, they end the year with about within a thousand dollars in the revolving account of what they started the year with. Um, we did have lower costs than expected. We did have higher revenues than expected, um, but overall the athletic accounts look very stable. Transportation revolving account was higher than expected. There were a few reasons for this. Uh, again, we took in more income in that revolving account than we had expected, and we also had lower costs in the account, but the main reason why we um, ended up with a $93,000 balance there was that we had an excess in other transportation accounts that we used to pay some of the um, regular ed transportation. So this puts us in good position for a capital plan moving forward. We're supposed to pay 50% of the cost for the bus projected to be bought in FY21. We were on track for that, um, but we were, uh, I'm sorry, for FY19, we were a little bit low on our projections for the buses in FY21 and FY22. Having that $93,000 there puts us in better shape to be ready to buy those buses when they come up on the capital plan. Next, food service. Um, this, there's some detail on the food service, um, which maybe I'll just take you to. If you go to the um, part of the report that says school lunch year end close balance, and I think the column that um, is easiest to, at least for me to read, is the second column, the year end revolving balance. And you can see that that revolving balance is higher than it's been in a long time. We're at $122,000 now. And that's been with a fairly steady, at least over the last three year, school committee expenditure of $40,000. So the difference there represents growth in revenue in the program. Also um, some savings that it, the program's been able to generate through purchase of commodities. Um, next, I'll talk about the cash forward balance, uh, or the carry forward balance. This is an area where um, all the rest of the things I think were, were good end of the year findings. This next one is a little bit disappointing. Um, we're closing the year with $71,000 in the carry forward balance, um, which will be returned to the city. Uh, you know, and the, the issue there certainly isn't with returning it to the city. The, the issue is our controls weren't strong enough and so that $71,000 is essentially frozen all year long. Um, we were expecting bills to come forward for special education students, and we were expecting a $10,000 uh, bill from Dell. Um, so those purchase orders that were cut at the end of last year with the prior year's budget never materialized. Um, so now that, that money will return to the general fund. Next, school lunch debt. Um, we closed FY17 with $8,400 in unpaid debt. We did have some credits in in the course of the year from John Tranfaglia's ongoing efforts to collect bad debt from prior years. So the total amount that the committee will need to um, subsidize in order to bring the, the school lunch program into a debt-free status for the end of the year is $5,377. Um, is, I, I guess I would just point out some people um, may be wondering with this growing school lunch year end close balance, should we be making an adjustment to the amount of the overall subsidy to the school lunch program? That's a little bit complicated um, for two reasons. One, um, the, the Department of Agriculture recommends that school lunch programs have a three month cash flow um, reserve on hand, so we're not quite there yet. The other thing is we use the $40,000 that the school committee um, appropriates to the school lunch program basically um, on a pro rata basis towards the cost of lunches to increase, not inappropriately, but increase the cost of the school lunch. If the school committee reduces their appropriation, then essentially the cost of the school lunch goes down, which can't happen. 
because you can't sell a lunch for less than the federal government reimburses you for. So if, there, may be, there may come a time when we want to reduce that amount, but we would have to offset the amount we were reducing by an equal amount of increase in the school lunch cost so that we weren't in a situation of selling lunches for less than the federal government reimburses us for. Um, and the, I would just finish the, the business administrator's report by announcing the gifts that I have, um, I've accepted under the school committee's policy in the past month. So on July 14th, we received a uh, GoFundMe donation from Bill Diamond for $485. That will be used in conjunction with PTO gifts towards a filling station, a, a water filling station at the high school. And we also um, received a material gift of risers from Smith College in it with an estimated value of $400 that will be used for the high school theater department. Okay. Any questions about the um, business administrator report? Okay. Will you be delivering the personnel report yes. tonight as well? <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> uh, in the month of July, we had four new hires. We had nine separations, eight of which were substitute teachers. We had two retirements. We had one promotion. Um, we always like to call those out. Andrea Sullivan is making a change from the ESP unit to the guidance secretary, um, to, to the clerical unit, will become the guidance secretary at NHS. Uh, I would also like to thank the 56 staff who worked in our summer school program. Those appear on your list because they were both hires and separations within the month of July. And that's the personnel report. Okay. So next we'll, finally, we'll move into the superintendent report. Okay. So this one will be a little bit longer than the usual report. I'm sorry, it's summer. Um, it's a laundry list of things that been, have been going on that I just want to bring the committee and the public up to date on. First, I want to talk about the response to intervention stakeholders group, which has held two meetings, um, one right at the end of the summer. Uh, and I really want to commend this group of teachers who works on uh, continuing to improve the RTI program. Um, we met on a Friday. It was actually the last Friday of the school year. And we met until about 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, which in schools is, is unusual. We also met over the summer when teachers were spread all over um, parts of New England via, via Skype. Um, so. Based on those two meetings, we really have four improvements to the RTI process that'll be coming coming out this year. First is to, can, to further streamline the assessment process. The second is to pr have a plan for s providing supports for students in grades four and five. Right now, we're, we're using up basically all of our RTI personnel in K-1-2. Third is creating structures for teachers to collaborate on intervention strategies. And the fourth is shifting data practices to include more contemporaneous student achievement data as opposed to MCAS solely. Um, these are all ideas that came forth from the teachers who were involved in the program, either as interventionists or as classroom teachers. Um, I think really that last one is, is really the one that's most exciting to me because we have data teams that are trained. They've received, I think, probably the best training you can get through DSAC and the district being level three for a number of years, but they're always working on MCAS data, which is old when you get it. And in elementary school, not applicable to most of the kids. You know, the fifth graders are already gone. The K-1 and 2 kids don't have scores. Um, so we're going to focus on using the skills that teachers have learned um, through M through DSAC, um, but focus more on the the screening data that we develop as part of the RTI program as opposed to MCAS only. Um, so we'll be putting out a guidance uh, document that provides more detail on each of these improvements, but I wanted the committee to understand that at a high level. Um, also in the category of ongoing meeting groups, earlier this week I convened a meeting with parents, staff, 
and students, a local expert in sexual harassment issues to discuss our three-pronged strategy for JFK. Um, I think it was a great meeting. I think we all left that meeting feeling energized, unified, and really, I think, confirming that that three-pronged strategy was the right one. Um, for me, that was important. Um, it was the best I could come up with, but I'm not an expert in this area. It was, it was really helpful for me to hear from someone who is that those are three really high leverage interventions to try. So again, that's working on curriculum, working on the reporting process, and the type of things we were talking about in the student handbook. So there'll be more information and training for students on that. And then um, the active bystander training for kids. So also this week, I met with the recipients of the NEF anti-racism grant. A major focus of that meeting was to coordinate the anti-racism work that this group will be doing with the training that Barbara Love and her team will be conducting for our staff as part of the district's uh, anti-bias training. Um, another part of that was to sort of situate the specific work of this anti-racism group within the overall anti-bias work of the school. Um, one of the things that uh, we agreed upon is that as a district we really need to be focused on all the isms as part of our anti-bias training so we'll be addressing racism ableism um, actually one of sexism one of the parents from the sexual harassment group who was also sort of linked into this conversation strongly was advocating for uh, ageism although I'm not sure we've got enough resources to go there yet um, but we will be um, we'll be sort of taking that sort of broad look and giving educators and all of our staff tools, I think, to examine their own bias as it relates to a number of different protected classes and also the intersections of protected classes. The, the NEF group will be focusing specifically and taking a deeper dive in anti-racism. So I think um, their product is, we, we started talking about what their product might look like. I think it's going to be really um, amazing and, and I think we, they probably will want to go beyond just the showcase of that and do some um, well, we're brainstorming ideas so that they can they can display what they've learned not only at that showcase that not everybody goes to and is not necessarily accessible to students but within the schools um, in a related matter I want to update the school committee on the five college diversifying the educator workforce coalition um, work I'm on that group as you know Julie's on that group as you know um, we're getting to the end of our planning grant stage I think we've gotten some strong strategies for increasing diversity uh, within the Pioneer Valley one of the things that I think has been um, a strength of this project is approaching it, it collaboratively so we're working with Holyoke and Springfield and Amherst and Hadley for those districts anyways already have much more success at attracting diverse teacher workforce than we do so we're learning from them um, and we're working together and it, the, the higher education partners have grown from the original five colleges to now include Holyoke Community College and Greenfield Community College so they're now partners in this so we have a lot of eyes trained on the problem we have a lot of people working on it we have some other strategies which I think we're going to implement beyond um, the diversifying educator workforce coalition but I wanted um, I wanted to let you know that we're sort of in the stages of finalizing that plan I'll be sharing that plan with you as well as talking to you about some other strategies that sort of we developed as part of the study process um, for this so um, next turning to ESPs you'll recall that the FY18 budget included 14 temporary ESP positions we put them in there because we really wanted to avoid layoffs in our care for our employees and also because we know that our turnover within the ESP unit is so high that we'd be needing those staff back anyways at some point during the year um, to as of today seven of those 14 ESPs have been moved into current uh, into temporary positions uh, created by ESPs who've resigned and we currently have 
seven more ESP vacancies posted, um, which close tomorrow. So by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll be moving the remaining seven temporary ESPs into permanent positions. So we'll be starting the year with all of our ESPs in a permanent spot. We will have exhausted that pool of temporary employees. And so now um, I will be coming to the school committee later on to say we need to transfer funds into an ESP sub account because remember we had zeroed that out with the thought that we would have the 14 um, floating ESPs, for lack of a better term, that could be our sort of on-site sub uh, workforce. Well, they're used now, they're in the class, so um, we'll have to make that adjustment probably at the next meeting. Next, I want to just end with the traditional August update on summertime facility upgrades. So we have two roof projects going on, as you know, Leeds and Bridge Street. The Bridge Street project is much more ambitious than the Leeds one. Um, at Bridge Street, we're essentially rebuilding the entire brick parapet of the school as well as replacing the, the roof. Um, and as always happens when you start doing repairs, you find other things that are wrong. So now we'll also be replacing several HVAC units on the roof as well. Um, we have had some contract delays. The project won't be done for the opening of school. Um, we have had conversations with the principal and the contractor about the need to um, honor the fact that school is in session and minimize the disruptions and, and sort of schedule, out, schedule um, the more disruptive and loud processes for before or after school. Um, but we anticipate that'll be done by the second week in October. The other uh, roof project is at Leeds. Um, this is sort of taking secondary status in terms of priority because it involves much less um, construction and it really is just the um, completion of the, the roof project that we began a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we were all disappointed and we discussed, I, or I reported to the committee um, this past winter that the part of the roof that we didn't replace because we thought it was good was not good. Uh, so we've had leaking and we've had leaking into the, the kindergarten classrooms on pretty much a, a cons consistent basis. Um, it's really bad once snow sets in because you get a snow pack that's constantly melting, which is constantly dripping. Um, that'll be gone um, before winter comes again. The uh, work there is sort of targeted more towards the end of August, starting beginning, starting at the end of August and wrapping up probably in October, November. So that will be all set before the snows hit again. Um, but when it rains, we still may have a few issues with leaks between now and then. The third big project was the Ryan Road gym floor. Um, I know that many of you have attended many of the school-wide events that are held in the gymnasium slash auditorium at, at Ryan Road which is a floor that was really showing its age. Um, so that entire floor is being replaced by a rubberized tile product. Um, it's it's a my first time uh, seeing this installation in a school. It's a really, I think, potentially interesting um, solution for elementary schools that don't already have existing wood floors because it's renewable. Um, so it will wear down over the course of several years, but it doesn't have to be completely removed and then a new thing reinstalled when it wears out. You can just sort of skim off the top layer and, and repaint the next layer down below. So that's big improvement for Ryan Road. And then um, just to, to, to finish it off, we are, have our second year of upgrades to the high school baseball field. We did um, most of the renovation work last year with a specific focus on the softball field. This year we finished the baseball field. Um, so those fields really um, will get some use in fall leagues, but will be really primarily for our students next spring. And that's my report. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Provost. So in terms of future business uh, meeting dates, um, we will have a regular scheduled meeting on September 14th at 7.15 in the JFK community room. Um, and now I will entertain a request for an executive session. All right, I'll make a motion of a request for an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law, open 
Open meeting for the approval of executive session minutes, May 25th, 2016, June 2nd, 2016, June 13th, 2016, June 16th, 2016, June 22nd, 2016, in Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. NACE, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. Is there a second? Yeah. Second. second. Okay. Um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Um, voting in the affirmative is to go into executive session. Yes. 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 Okay, so the school committee has voted to move into executive session. I'll tell the members of the public um, that uh, we are moving into executive session because to have this discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on our negotiating position. I will also announce that we will uh, be adjourning directly from the executive session. Okay, thank you. <laughs>